great to celebrate the book's publication with all of you. I live in New York now. I've lived in New York my whole life. I've never, even now as I publish a book about global warming, thought of myself really as an environmentalist. I, I like nature. I think it's beautiful. And for most of my life, I thought it was nice to keep air clean and streams clear. And I thought it would be better if there was less pollution rather than more. I'm also a you know American child of the 1990s. I'm really a child of the end of history. I believe that like technocratic forces and market forces could solve major problems like climate change if we directed them in the right way. And um, I sort of trusted that our leaders would be responsible enough to take the necessary action to um, you know to address those issues. As a result, I spent most of my adult life thinking that climate change was an important issue, one that was going to unfold over the course of my lifetime, but not one that I needed to prioritize when I thought about my own politics and not one that I thought that people I knew should prioritize necessarily. It felt like one political cause among many rather than an overarching, all-encompassing story and threat. And Beginning sometime in 2016, I don't really know for sure, I started seeing what I found to be much more alarming bits of news coming out of the scientific community about climate. I've always been someone who's interested in the near future and sort of unfolding big picture storylines, and so I was you know, always keeping an eye on new academic research in a variety of areas, but all of a sudden it seemed like there was some really, really weak news coming from climate science. and. The story that I saw reflected in newspapers, on television, when I talked to friends about it, when I talked to family about it, those stories were not reflective of the news that I was seeing coming out of the research. Um, they seemed maybe ticking up a little bit in terms of alarm, but they were not nearly as scary or horrifying as the material I was finding when I was looking at the, the real research. And I, just as a journalist, responded to that with a kind of perverse exhilaration, which is to say, like, I saw it as a story that was not being told, not being told properly, not being told with the drama that it had, and not being told with the urgency that it needed, that needed to be um, put forward. And I felt that there was a kind of storytelling opportunity there. As much as this was a political issue, as much as it is a scientific issue, I also felt that there was a real storytelling opportunity and I felt that I could take that story and tell it in a much bigger and more dramatic way than really anybody had been doing before. And I had three basic ideas about what that would mean. So each of them are about a sort of misapprehension that I had and I think a lot of people like me had even just a few years ago about climate change in which I, all three of which I wanted to kind of correct. The first was about the speed of change we had been taught for a really long time that climate change was something that was happening slowly, that would unfold probably over centuries and at the very fast end, over decades. And therefore we had a lot of time to develop technology to deal with it, to grow economically so that we could afford more aggressive investments in green energy. But it was something for at most our children, probably our grandchildren to be dealing with and worrying about. And the moral calculus that that implied was such a distended one that nobody really responded to it immediately as though it was about their own lives. In fact, half of all of the emissions, the carbon emissions that we put into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels have come in the last 30 years, which means that we've done more damage since Al Gore published his first book on climate change than in all of the history of humanity before that, all of the centuries before that, all of the millennia before that. And we're doing that damage very much in real time, as we're seeing with extreme weather just over the last couple of years. We're doing the damage in real time and we're seeing the effects in real time. Climate change is not something that's happening over centuries, it's happening at the scale of years. We're living through it now and it's only gonna get worse if we don't avert course. So that was the first big thing, that was the speed of climate change. The second was the scope. I mean, I, I happen to live in New York, I live by the coastline, I probably should have thought a little bit more about this, but I felt that when we talked about sea level rise, most of us, most of humanity, was going to be safe from that. And because we hadn't heard much about the other threats of climate change, it meant to me that global warming was something that would only impact a very small sliver of the human population. And it turns out, I mean, not turns out, everybody knew this all along, but it was not being reflected in the stories being told about climate, that 
This is an all-encompassing system. Obviously, when we walk outside, even when we walk down the street in Manhattan, we are walking through climate. That climate is changing. And the impact that it will have on our lives wherever we live, the list goes, you know, goes on so long and probably just like an abbreviated rundown is, um, is best, but like it affects our public health, it affects the development of our children, it affects the rate at which people are admitted to mental hospitals, it affects rates of violence between individuals, murder rates, domestic assault, rape, um, it affects war between nations. For every half degree of warming, we're expected to see between a 10 and 20% increase in war, which means if we end up by the end of the century where we're headed, we're gonna have twice as much war as we have today. It impacts economic growth, so the best economic research suggests that, again, if we head where we're headed, we'll have a global economy that's at least 20 and perhaps 30% smaller than it would be without climate change. And at that point, we could have seen as much as $600 trillion in climate damages. That's double all the wealth that exists in the world today. These are impacts that are gonna hit you no matter where you live, no matter what kind of life you live. It's true that if you're wealthier, you will be buffered from them a little bit by that wealth, but there is no escaping it. And I felt that that was very much not coming through in the storytelling about climate, which seemed to me to um, really be suggesting if you stayed off the coastline, you were gonna be safe. If you weren't living in Miami Beach, or Bangladesh, you were going to be safe. The more I looked into it, the more that just seemed totally ridiculous. Um, so that's the scope of the threat. And the third one is the severity. Scientists had long understood the system. They understand the science very well, um, whatever the deniers will say. And they understood that at about two degrees of warming, many, many things were going to start to happen very quickly that would make just about everything that we understood as permanent about life on this planet um, shake a little bit at best and possibly you know fall away and, and be destroyed um, at worst so they talked about two degrees as the threshold of catastrophe that's the phrase they often used and that meant that when you were like a tv producer or a magazine journalist or a newspaper writer um, telling the story of climate change you tended to think that that was about as bad as it could get and that went especially that was especially true for the readers and viewers of those stories and in fact, there's this huge amount of warming that's possible north of two degrees. In fact, I think there's almost no um, path of conventional decarbonization that will allow us to avoid two degrees of warming. So two degrees, which has been called the threshold of catastrophe, I think is functionally our floor of warming. We're on track for about four degrees of warming, actually a little north of four degrees of warming. And that range, two degrees to four degrees, was basically undiscussed in any of the climate journalism that I was seeing. And I thought that that was a terrible indictment of our media, and also was begging for, it was begging to be addressed by a writer who could look at it and outline exactly what life would be like at those ranges, which is what this book has to do. Thanks, and so I think this is a great point that you're raising, that some of the scenarios you're painting in this picture, which are truly devastating scenarios, refugee crises, rising seas, droughts, pandemics, uh, that these are not uh, sort of the extreme cases of climate change. These are actually two to four degrees, which is where we're generally headed, even if we take some of the more dramatic action that is being contemplated. Uh, so can we talk a little bit about the alarm and the catastrophe? Because it, you make the point that in the scientific community there have been people, the James Hansons of the world, uh, Al Gore, who is quasi-scientific political community, uh, who've been raising the alarm about climate change for decades. Um, there have been some writers, you know, not necessarily mainstream uh, press writers, sort of raising the alarm about this, Bill McKibben, Rob Galston. But where you've come into this today, you just had this piece in the Sunday Review in the Times, uh, where you're really saying, actually, now is the time to panic, right? This is not just um, about um, acting urgently on a problem that's going to unfold later. We should be sort of engaging in catastrophic thinking in order to trigger a response. Uh, can you say a little bit more, because I think that's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, I think there are people who think, well, actually, maybe catastrophic thinking is not the way to get through this crisis. Maybe what we need is level-headed pragmatism to get through this crisis. So why, why are you making the case for catastrophic thinking? Well, the short answer is um, I think those two are actually the same. We're at a state with a climate where pragmatic thinking involves considering some really, really scary scenarios. And we have psychological reflexes that make some of these possible outcomes 
um, unthinkable to us or close to unthinkable. But that's not, that doesn't mean that they're unlikely or that we're, um, you know, if we just avert our eyes, we'll be fine. We're in a situation, we're now at about 1.1 degrees of warming. Really, it's, we're already in a kind of unprecedented climate state. The planet is now warmer than it's ever been during the entire history of humanity, um, which means no human has ever walked the planet, uh, walked a planet that's as hot as the one that we're walking on now. And that means that everything that we know as human history and human civilization, it was built on a climate system that we've left behind. Um, now, what that means for the future, I think, is very much up in the air. The biggest factor is the human input, what we decide to do, what action we decide to take, and how much more carbon we decide to put into the atmosphere. But it is possible that many things that we've taken for granted as truly stable features of our modern life become very quickly quite unstable. And when we're in that situation, I don't think it makes sense to assume the best. I think it makes sense to plan for the worst. Even not even the worst. I mean, there are, there are a lot of reasons to think that we could trigger some of what's called feedback loops that could bring us north of four degrees to five or six degrees this century, which would be truly, truly um, harrowing. When you're facing you know, a near-term future in which things like 200 million climate refugees by the year 2050, that's the projection that the UN makes. That's the low end projection that the UN makes. 200 million climate refugees. Their high end estimate is 1 billion. That's as many people as live in North and South America combined. I don't think those estimates are actually so accurate. I would, I would put it at more 100 to 200 million. But 1 million Syrian refugees completely destabilized European politics. And we're talking about the possibility in the very near future of a global, climate, a global refugee crisis that's 100 times worse, or worse than that even. And given that scenario, it just seems to me very clear that we should be taking seriously um, projections of um, really bleak outcomes so that we can better adapt, so that we can take more aggressive action to prevent them, and so that we can acquaint ourselves with the nature of life on a planet that might be warmed as much as two or three or four degrees. And that's actually the kind of, to me, the central theme of the book is not what the science um, tells us about what we're going to see climate-wise, but what that means for the way that we will all live together on the planet, for our politics, for our culture. Well, that's um, one thing I think is really interesting here, because in some ways, um, there's a part of this book that I read as a compendium of sort of these devastating impacts that we can expect from climate change, which, by the way, as you've mentioned, are not the worst possible impacts from climate change. They're just the most likely um, uh, if we continue on the current course. Uh, but in another way, I think your book can be read as um, a compendium of sort of um, both institutional and cultural considerations um, that these scientific impacts or these sort of physical impacts of disasters that are man-made disasters, but we would normally call natural disasters, um, but how they're going to change the way we see ourselves, how they're going to change institutions. And I, I find it really interesting that two of the things that you pointed out, one is that this problem to some degree sort of, um, it, it leads to a sort of conclusion because of the scale of the problem, and that it's a global problem involving many nations, many communities, many regions and actors that requires a sort of level of global cooperation. And this is coming at a time when we're seeing increasing nationalism around the world. In fact, those nationalist tendencies in Europe that you just uh, hinted at that have um, been in part a response to the Syrian refugee crisis. So in a way, you sort of see the problem of climate change exacerbating the ability of institutions to respond. And then the other point that you're raising is um, that part of this is a uh, a question of politics that our individual uh, um, decisions to some degree have an impact, but uh, that we really need a functional politics. And of course, if we look around us um, at the moment, uh, we don't have a functional politics in this country. And uh, so when you think about some of those implications of the book um, and, and sort of how you've um, how you sort of diagnose what we need relative to where we are. Uh, do you see any path uh, through that? And do you see a way that we can sort of reclaim? Um, is there any potential um, uh, scenario in which climate change actually uh, forces us 
to, to sort of fix some of these deep institutional problems? Well, I hope so, and I do think that, I mean, I do, I, my answer is yes, um, but it's a kind of qualified, we'll see, yes. Um, I think it's really important for everyone to keep in mind, and this is something I need to remind myself too, even as I talk about it, that all of these really horrifying impacts that we're projecting for later in the century um, are not written in stone, that if we get there, it will be because of the human action that is taken between now and then. Um, climate change is a very, climate is a very very responsive system. So while there's some short time lag between the temperature between what we do in terms of carbon and the temperature we see, it's really a, a time lag of a couple of years, and that means that we are always empowered to take action again in real time to avert the worst scenarios. And you know, I try to remind myself it's something I write in the book. When you think about the scale of devastation that is possible, say four degrees of warming, that can be completely overwhelming and incapacitating. But it's also a sign of just how much power we have over the climate system as humans. We will be bringing it there if we bring it there. And if we avoid it, it will be our doing that we have avoided it. So there's a way in which you can look at, perversely, just how bad things could get as a sign of just how much we can do to stop things from getting bad at all. Now, practically speaking, this is a crisis that demands action at many, many different levels. There's been a lot of focus recently on, on individual choice lifestyle um, decisions, which I personally think is a little misguided because I think that the achievements of policy can be much, much, much greater. So that, you know, if I eat no meat, the impact on my carbon footprint is quite small. But um, if we legislate that all cattle farmers have to feed their cows, methane that will reduce their um, carbon footprint possibly as much as 95 percent which would basically eliminate the entire carbon problem of beef um, that's not something that i can do individually but it is something that my policymakers can do and there are solutions like that everywhere you look in climate um, some of it has to do with fuel efficiency and in some cases i think we're at a position where we might want our policymakers to outright ban things like um, new internal combustion engines i do think that the crisis is that present but um, there are smaller solutions too. Each of them are, will have a much bigger impact if they come through policy than if they come through individual choice. Then there's the kind of national level of politics. And you know, on that, I think, actually, I'm, I'm really encouraged. The movement of the Democratic Party has been really rapid over the last couple of years on this issue in the US. And in the middle of the, even in the middle of the Obama administration, the idea that anything like the Green New Deal would have been proposed would have been left out of the room. Now I think that that proposal... Was proposed by Van Jones, who was an Obama... Well, the term was, yeah. Um, but I mean, the stimulus, the green stimulus that Obama put into the, um, into the stimulus package was um, quite trivial compared to what's being proposed now, and that was, at the time, considered a completely unprecedented investment, which is, was hugely helpful. I mean, it's one of the reasons that we've had so much progress on, on green energy over the last decade is because of that investment. But compared to what's being proposed now, it's a drop in the bucket. And that movement is, you know, by the standards of um, American politics, I think really quite rapid and quite encouraging. I think there are many questions about the Green New Deal. I think that we don't really know what it means. We don't really know what it would entail. But at the very least, it's putting the science, the findings of the UN and the IPCC, at the center of American climate policy, or proposing that we do that. Literally, like the text begins with, quote, a long quoted passage from the from the UN, and that's unprecedented. It's also visible in the in the polling. The sort of gold standard for climate polling is this Yale Communications Survey, which comes out every December. Americans are, you know, we're at an all-time high for people who are concerned about warming, for people who think it's real and what's happening now. Both are above 70%. Both have jumped at least 15 points just in the last three years. People concerned about warming have jumped eight points just since March. So the public opinion is moving quite rapidly. I think our politics is moving relatively rapidly. And it's true that we have a recalcitrant party that's really reluctant to take action and even take seriously the problem. But when you start to hit 70% um, on anything, it's really hard for any, for any party to you know, endure that pressure. What's interesting about the Yale Communication uh, Program studies is that they also show that Republicans and Democrats, that there's a, an uptick and a large majority that believe in sort of common solutions, policy solutions to climate change. So in a way, I think we are seeing more convergence and a lot of growth. Um, I want to get back to this idea, I mean, because you just said something about 
sort of having this power, right? Realizing, once you contemplate the scope of this problem, realizing we have this power to tinker with the climate system. And I think part of what's happening now in at least the scientific community and in some of the environmental community uh, that, that deals with this problem is that there's enough panic about where we're headed that um, the sort of ideas that were once considered outlandish, like solar geoengineering, these sort of like Bond villain ideas of pumping a bunch of sulfates into the atmosphere to reflect back um, solar radiation to keep the Earth cooler, these ideas are actually being considered more within the realm of the reasonable. And I know you write about solar geoengineering in the book. I'm just curious for you, do you see these things? I mean, is this um, a solution we need to engage? Are we at the level of panic where we need to start engaging some of these solutions in a more serious way? And or is seeing them um, being used, is it sort of inevitable that someone's going to end up trying to engineer the planet to save it from, um, save themselves from warming? The UN says that we have, that basically there's no path to staying below two degrees without what are called negative emissions, um, which is a, a variety of techniques um, having to do with, um, you can do new, new forest planting, um, you can do it technologically with machines. I happen to think personally that those approaches are more responsible than, um, than solar geoengineering. I think that we don't yet know what geoengineering would mean for our agriculture, for our public health. Nine million people are dying already annually every year from aerosol pollution, which is quite like what we would be putting into the atmosphere um, if we engaged in a geoengineering project. So I had a conversation, long conversation a few weeks ago with a person who's doing the sort of most exciting research on, it's called carbon capture technology, which is machines that suck carbon out of the atmosphere. He is therefore someone who is poised to benefit to the tune of trillions of dollars if this technology is deployed at a global scale to solve um, the carbon problem, which it theoretically could be, could, that could happen. And he was like, no, uh, solar engineering is much more responsible than carbon capture. This sort of floored me, because I, he, this is a guy, David Keith, he works at Harvard, he's um, funded by Bill Gates, it's a company called Carbon Engineering, I think, um, and he had demonstrated in the Bring, I think, a, te a technology that would allow you to take carbon out of the atmosphere at the cost of $94 a ton, as low as $94 a ton. That means that you could totally neutralize all of the carbon that we put into the atmosphere from all of the, all global economic activity for about $3 trillion a year, which sounds like a lot, but also not an like, unbelievable amount. And it's actually less than some estimates for how much we subsidize the fossil fuel business today. So theoretically, we could just redirect those subsidies to this technology and we would immediately be solving the problem, or at least stabilizing the climate and allowing um, us more time to decarbonize. But he was saying, it's still way more expensive to take carbon out of the atmosphere than to put it in there in the first place. That money would be better spent investing more aggressively in decarbonization rather than carbon capture because decarbonization is going to take much longer than we have time for. We basically just need to buy ourselves some time and that the cheapest way of doing that is with um, some kind of solar geoengineering project, which is something he also researches. He's not strictly a carbon capture guy. So he, his idea is like for the next 50 years, we'll like float some sulfate particles in the atmosphere cool the earth, keep the earth about 1.5 degrees while we figure out how to decarbonize everything that we do, which is, you know, we think of it almost entirely in terms of energy and electricity, but that's just a part of it. It's transportation, infrastructure, industry, agriculture, just about everything we do in the world has a carbon footprint. And we need to zero out that carbon quite quickly, like in the next three decades, or else we're going to be in a really, really devastating climate scenario. My feeling is, you know, like, it's kind of, I kind of think it's like an all hands on deck situation. I'm not totally opposed to geoengineering, but I'm scared of what it would mean for us. And I'm certainly not ready to say that it's like the, the best path forward. But I also think that we probably do have to begin thinking about a future in which we're managing the climate rather than thinking of it as something that's happening distant and beyond our control. Because we are already engineering the climate that we're living in, and we need to do it in a much more responsible way. The most responsible way is through rapid decarbonization, but I think that, like David Keith does, I don't think that we're gonna be able to do that quickly enough to really avert catastrophic warming, so we need to figure out some other paths. Yeah. One of the analogies I heard for 
Heath Solar geoengineering idea is sort of like giving morphine to a heroin addict in the sense that we might create another addiction to another technology, but we might also need it. If we're dependent on a suspended umbrella of particles in the atmosphere, we'd be very vulnerable to terrorism. Any country that was like hoping to sabotage parts of the world could do it through a military strike, which is again, this is like immediately, we're now in the territory of sci-fi. I feel like I've just like pulled us out of climate into sci-fi. This is one of the ways in which the future of our geopolitics are likely to look very different than the geopolitics that we have today, that we may be negotiating wars over our sulfur umbrella. This is not something that anybody would have expected 50 years ago, but I do think that as we move forward into the 21st century, carbon is going to become the center of the way that we think about our relationship to the planet and the relationship to each other, both as individuals and as nations. And so it won't be a surprise to see trade deals that feature carbon budgets and sanctions put on countries that are behaving poorly when it comes to carbon. That's just the beginning. Theoretically, you could see real enforcement mechanisms being put into place to make sure that every country is behaving responsibly, by which I mean something up to and including military enforcement mechanisms. Now that's, I think, still quite a far ways off, but it's not, I think, not at all inconceivable that, say, over the course of the next 75 years, something like that could emerge. Or that the dominant countries in the world make it so clear to the other countries in the world that bad behavior on carbon is unacceptable, that the mere threat of that kind of response is enough to uh, motivate action. But I don't know exactly what form it'll take. I do feel very strongly that it will come to dominate our life in the coming decades in the same way that modernity wants to find our lives. Financial capitalism, you could say, wants to find our lives. Climate change will be that meta-narrative for the next few decades. And we've only just begun to think about what that will mean. Yeah, one way in which you've done some thinking about that, which you mention in the book, is that as you were writing this book, you were grappling with the decision whether or not to have a child, and you did, and you have an 11-month-old beautiful daughter. What's her name? Raka. Raka. Yeah. Well, can you share a little bit about that decision? Because I think for a lot of us who are concerned about this problem, who work on this problem, that that is a very much um, a relevant question, either if um, we have kids and we're wondering you know, what kind of world they're going to live in, or if we're deciding whether or not to, and um, what the moral impacts are, and really what the, the consequences of it are. Yeah, I think there, there's sort of two, I get to ask this question a lot, I think there are basically two parts to it. The first is whether you want to add a set of carbon footprints to the world, whether you want to impose a burden on the planet. And the second is, whether you want to inflict what is likely to be a planet of suffering on the life of your child. On the first point, I think, personally, having looked at this in some depth, that we could absolutely be at a, you know, a population of 11 or 12 billion and live sustainably at that level if we got there in the right way. So I don't really think that like the imposition of an extra set of carbon footprints is all that problematic, but it's connected to the point I make when I answer this question all the time on the second question, which is about securing a future for our children. And to me, none of this is written in stone. And I think you need to want to fight to secure a life like the one that you want for yourself and your family, rather than pulling back and surrendering before that fight has been won or lost. If Raka's life is going to be dominated by climate suffering 50 years down the road. Again, it will be because what we do from here on out. It won't be because of what we've done to this point. Therefore, it's like an incitement to activism, to mobilizing, to making change now, so that she can live in the way that I want her to live, and that I can live in the way that I want to live, because some of these changes could be happening in my own lifetime. I think part of that is a little bit sort of self-interested delusion. I, I wanted to have ch children, like many people want to have children. Like anybody who lives in the modern world, even though I also live in climate science, I manage through compartmentalization and denial, and it may be the case that whatever change we can manage, Raka's life will still be scarred by climate change in ways that I wish it wasn't. But I also know that that will be, be, that will be an indictment of us. It's not something that we know is inevitable, it is entirely within our power to change. Therefore, like having a kid is kind of a, an argument for, for fighting. I'm not someone who was disinterested in the future of humanity before I had a kid, but 
it does give a little more clarity to the questions um, that you ask when you're thinking about 50 or 70 years in the future. They have a different emotional impact when you're asking them about your own child than about some abstract sense of the future of the species. And I think more of us need to be invested in that future rather than less. Thanks, personal state. I think we're going to open it up to questions from the audience, and there's one right here. My name is Bill Einbruster. I'm a retired journalist. You've mentioned, you've mentioned solar geoengineering a few times, but haven't defined it. I sort of have an idea, but can you? Oh, yeah, I, think, I thought you didn't mention it, um, but it's um, basically we suspend aerosol particles in the atmosphere so that sunlight would be reflected back into outer space rather than being absorbed by the Earth. And that would have a, depending on how much you did, would have some effect on the temperature. So you could cool it by a half a degree or a degree. It would also mean that, that the sort of natural climate system would not be cooled. It would just be a sort of masking effect. And that's the danger I mentioned with the terrorism, for instance, that if the aerosol was, you know, we're suspending aerosol. If we stopped suspending aerosol, then immediately the planet would heat up to some unconscionable level, which is one of the reasons that there's a kind of moral hazard that Rina mentioned in, in um, taking that approach, because it, it means that we won't have to take action on carbon in the way that we probably should. I think it's important to mention that uh, doing that kind of uh, thing to temporary, temporarily cool the planet wouldn't address the acidification of the oceans, which is also an issue because of the carbon dioxide emissions and the carbon absorption of the oceans, which is contributing to the death of coral reefs, among other problems. And there's some other research that suggests that it would have no positive impact on agriculture at all. So to the extent that we'd be taking the action to make our, allay our concerns about agricultural yields, there would be no impact. So there are a lot of reasons why it's a, a bad, a scary <laughs> idea. There's a question right here. Your work has been so productive in so many ways of conversations. I assign it on my syllabi. I'm a professor at Fordham. So I have uh, three questions that I'll make really quick, I promise. The first is airline travel. In terms of individual choices, what do you make of airline travel as an individual consumer action that could be effective? And I'm thinking, for example, of the former um, commitment of Eric Holthaus to not fly because of climate catastrophe. Second question, who's the we? We is invoked a lot. It's a useful term. I think it also elides a lot of uneven realities in terms of justice and access and geography and value systems. And so are you addressing this primarily to an American audience, to World Economic Forum attendees? The third is, you know, as a journalist, I, I so appreciate, and as I mentioned, assign your work. It, uh, as an aside, several of my students confessed on Friday that uh, they had to take quote-unquote depression naps after reading <laughs> some of your work because, the, you know, the scope, the apocalypticism, the what do we do in the face of this. And one of the things we've been talking about is the power of story, the power of narrative. I wonder if you could name for us some of the environmental journalists who you think are doing a great job at anchoring those conversations that are both um, scientific and ethical and, and really hit home in important ways. Yeah, well, that, that's, that one's the easiest one to answer, so I'll do it first. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to sound like I may have sounded before that I'm dismissive or derisive towards other environmental journalists. I'm in awe of many of them in part because they've been doing it much longer and with much more intense commitment than, than I have. Um, or have had until recently. Um, I mean, I think Betsy Colbert and Bill McKibben are the sort of gold standards. Um, I think Jeff Goodell, who was up here earlier, has done really great work. Um, I think Eric Holthouse has been um, terrific. Um, Chris Mooney at the Washington Post. Um, I think a lot of the stuff that's been done, I mean, I, I think actually, like, um, there's a lot of great work being done out there by a lot of different people. Um, and. I'm excited by the like the Times initiative, the Times as a whole climate desk now. Um, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I think we've we've we're en we're entering into a new period of storytelling about climate. So when I was talking about the shortcomings of climate storytelling, I was really talking about the way I saw it, say, from the time I became sentient till about five years ago. And I do think things are changing quite rapidly. Um, I think that um, you're, you're just seeing more and more stories every day, um, and I, I think you're also seeing readers engage and viewers engage with them, which is just as encouraging as the production of the stories in the first place. Um, on the other two questions, yeah, I mean, um, air travel is really bad. Um, it's uh, the biggest, it's the biggest contributor 
of, um, to the carbon footprint of the world's wealthiest people. Um, and by that I don't just mean like the 0.001%, I mean most of the people in this room. Um, one cross country plane ticket in the US is the equivalent of eight months of driving. Um, so yeah, I mean every time you get on a flight you're really doing some damage. I think the, um, the data point is that for um, every round trip ticket from New York to London, you melt three square meters of ice. Um, of Arctic ice, every seat on that plane. Um, it's really, really bad. I mean, it's way bigger than the impact that you have um, by eating hamburgers or whatever. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't really, in many cases, an alternative, um, unless you want to forego um, an experience in the, in the global world, which I think a lot of people don't want to do. Um, there aren't electric planes right around the corner. Um, you know, we can invest in high-speed rail, but that solves the problem only at a certain scale. Like, you can't go to Singapore on high-speed rail. Um, and I don't think it's, personally, I don't think it's all that realistic to imagine a world in which um, the global wealthy retreat from those kinds of lifestyle choices. Um, so the question is how we can manage that carbon impact. And um, actually, one of the reasons that David Keith's research is so exciting is that he's trying to use this carbon, and this carbon capture technology to produce effectively carbon neutral fuel that could be used in um, a technology like a plane. So there are certain, some sectors like electricity generation that are relatively easy to um, green, and there are others like jet travel that are really hard to green, and um, because we can't just use a different kind of fuel. Uh, but if we can produce a carbon neutral jet fuel, that would be a huge gift. I don't know whether we'll get there, but it's possible. Um, personally, it's the one part of my own life that I feel really guilty about. Um, when, you know, when I'm asked about my own lifestyle choices, I honestly don't feel guilty about a lot of them. Um, but air travel is one that really does bother me, and I'm not sure how much it's going to affect my life. But for all those who are responding to that guilt by um, doing less of it, I think that's admirable and honorable and laudable. Um, what was the second one? Sorry. That was about who's the we? Oh, yeah. That's a really, really big, important question. Um, it gets back to what you were asking earlier about, you know, all the political dysfunction um, at several different levels. Um, at the basic level, the we is humanity. This is a system that will challenge, impact, probably damage the lives of everyone on the planet. Those impacts are distributed unequally, the world's poor will be hit hardest, and be less, least able to deal with it. But it is a universal system, it encloses all of us, and I think that it is both a kind of naive and honest way of looking at the problem to think that the we is all of us. Now the question is, how do we get to a politics that puts that vision into action? And this is something I'm really concerned about. Um, even when you see climate action at a national level, um, huge mobilizations, public leaders taking very strong rhetorical positions, those nations are still kind of incentivized in our current system to slow off their own action, um, to let the rest of the world clean up the mess. And I'm not sure that there, I see a way in our current politics to solve that problem through um, true international organization. This reminds me, I got to meet the filmmaker Ron Howard a few years ago, and he asked me what I did, and I told him I worked on climate change, and he said, uh, as a cineast would, you know what you need? You need a good old-fashioned alien invasion if you want humanity yeah. united around that problem. Yeah. Problem is the enemy is us, right? We don't have a common enemy as humanity, or that's at least one of the problems. Um, we had a question here. Uh, I have a quite different time frame than I think what I heard tonight. You're talking about a decade for geoengineering solutions. Uh, to me, it seems like the climate change is here today. It was here yesterday. And that we need to do things immediately. Uh, and that there are uh, available technologies which don't have rather far-reaching technological challenges, such as solar and wind power. Uh, we have also, potentially, in the Senate to be talked about the uh, Green New Deal. So I'm wondering if there's uh, 
a greater sense of urgency that you feel at all in your work and uh, how you feel that uh, we can make changes rather soon, uh, much sooner rather than later, because I see that, you know, with the Greenland ice sheet uh, potentially falling off and stopping the uh, Gulf Stream, you know, many rather realistic scenarios in the very immediate future. Um, I think climate change is absolutely here, and it's already terrifying. But I think it's important to keep in mind that it's not a binary system, so this is not an issue of whether climate change is here or not, whether we're fucked or not. It's, um, it's really, you know, every tick upward that we get with the temperature, things will get worse, and it will always be the case that we can uh, make things better or worse going forward. The urgency is, as you describe it, I mean, it's, um, I don't think it's possible that we get, that we could zero out all of our carbon emissions by 2030, as say the Green New Deal calls for. I think that's just because of political inertia, what it means to get big infrastructure projects going. But I would like to try. I think that we need to try, and we need to try to do everything we can to get this done as quickly as we can. I certainly don't think that it makes sense to delay on any front. I think it's a kind of an all hands on deck situation as you describe. And in fact, the climate impacts are happening and coming much, much faster than most had predicted um, even a short while ago. So while I'm, for instance, not all that worried about the shutdown of the, uh, the Gulf Stream, it doesn't seem crazy that you would be worried about it. It seems there are many scenarios like that that are um, really terrifying and um, yeah, quite plausible. Um, and we need to do everything we can to avert them right away. It seems that it's been sorely lacking. It's been lacking for 30 years since Al Gore sounded these alarms, as you say, and everybody along the way. And here we are at a moment where finally, you know, 70% of America is waking up because California is burning and mudslides and earthquakes and all the calamities we see. If we change the political dialogue about, oh my God, it's happening, how do we survive it? It will get the panic that's needed to change the political will globally that will also help people move, toward, move at the speed that needs to be moved at to, to, to really have an effect. I think that we do need to invest in resiliency and adaptation and mitigation for sure. We're going to be dealing with some really serious issues very quickly, but I don't at all want to forego the, um, you know, the decarbonization program, which is to me vital because, as I was just saying, you know, while we're seeing catastrophic warming already, we're going to see ever more catastrophic warming in the decades ahead, it will always be the case that um, things could get worse if we don't reduce our carbon footprint, or they could get less worse or even theoretically better if we move more aggressively. And so I don't want to at all give up on the decarbonization program, even as we invest in mitigation and adaptation. I have the same kind of answer on the rhetorical part of that question, which is to say, I think all kinds of storytelling on this are valuable. I'm someone who's, you know, I've written a book that traffics in fear and alarm, but there's hope in it too, there's optimism in it too. And no, honestly, um, it, and I think that that, that is, um, that's, that's like a kind of a good model for this subject generally, that um, we should not insist on a single way of seeing the story. It is a story that's too big to see only one way. And there are going to be people who respond to fear. There are going to be people who respond to technocratic optimism. There are going to be people who respond to market opportunities. There are going to be people who respond to the threat to their own families and communities. And there are going to be people who respond to the kind of global Gaia like tragedy of it. And we should use all of those tools. We should tell all of those stories. And we should be engaging people on all of those fronts. Um, it's not just one way. It's like, it's every way. It has to be every way. I just want to know if we can credibly decarbonize without nuclear, or is that going to have to be part of the mix? Well, my, my feeling about nuclear is that we certainly shouldn't be closing the nuclear plants that we have going now, which is something that's happening in parts of the world and making decarbonization much harder. As to what kind of a, what part of the equation it is going forward, I, I don't really know. It's, it's really expensive to build a new nuclear plant. It's much more expensive than building new wind and solar. Um, and so I think it may be the case that it does not make economic sense going forward to depend on nuclear rather than wind and solar. But I also think it's possible that we make some technological innovations that make it cheaper again, and we can invest in it again. On the very particular, like what we're doing in the near term question, it also takes a really long time to build a nuclear plant. And if we're really hoping to have our um, 
our carbon emissions by 2030, which is what the UN says we need to do to avert real catastrophic warming, new nuclear almost can't be part of that equation because the, um, the timeline to construction is too long. But if we're talking about securing an energy future in 2060, 2070, even 2040, um, I think it's possible that um, new innovations could make nuclear, again, a bigger part of our portfolio. I'm certainly not someone who thinks that we should consider nuclear a dirty energy source or a toxic energy source. I think that it has potential. What are the sort of um, professional streams that young people who are feeling passionate about could channel? Like, where do they need to go? What do they need to be learning to be innovators in this space to be taking on the mantle of this problem? How do we train them for it? And what, what should they be doing? Great question. We'll take one more. Obviously, um, developed nations are resistant and sometimes clueless about what we actually need to do. As our, while developing nations might know more about what we actually need to do, they're resistant. So I'm curious if you can comment on what you see as possible for a framework of actually getting where we need to go based on Paris Accords and based on other international frameworks and the resistance on both sides of that spectrum. Those kids, I um, admire them enormously and am exhilarated by what they're doing. Um, I see similar activism, exciting activism in the US. I think the Juliana lawsuit here is really thrilling. Um, I think that young people have um, a moral stature on this issue that is undeniable and manages to come through even, you know, even when we live in a horribly partisanized politics as we do. You, in the same way that the Parkland students did not seem to be speaking for the Democratic Party, from the Democratic Party, even though their talking points were on the American left. I think there's a similar thing with Greta Thunberg, all the climate strikers, and the Giuliani kids in the US, that they're, they just seem to be speaking much more directly, much more urgently about the immoral behavior of their parents and grandparents. Um, and I think that that's extremely powerful. I think I wouldn't ask of them yet anything beyond just mobilizing. Um, I think that that political force is the force that we need. Um, I think that whenever, whenever you're thinking about how we could solve this problem, I think the only answer is politics. And these kids are such a new and exciting and energetic force in global politics. I just want to see that force grow. I don't yet want to divert them into other fields. I mean, it's possible that they'll become elected officials, it's possible they'll become technological innovators, it's possible they'll become scientists, but for the time being, I think what they're doing now is, you know, the most honorable work being done in the world, and um, I just would want to celebrate that rather than um, give them any advice. They can't take any advice from me. Um, on, the, um, on the question of geopolitical framework, um, you know, my, I mentioned earlier, I, I think of myself as a kind of child of the 90s. A lot of my inner emotional intuitions about this issue come from that era. So I want to see the Paris Accords work. I want to see something like the Paris Accords govern our carbon future. But I think the returns are really grim. No major industrialized country in the world is on track to meet its, Paris, its commitments under the Paris Accords. And even if they did, we'd still be on track for over three degrees of warming, which would mean the total loss of all ice sheets. Yeah. Um, it would mean you know, hundreds of trillions of dollars in, in climate damages. It would mean hundreds of millions of climate refugees around the world. Um, wildfires that would be, uh, what's the number, 16 times as bad as they were last year in California. 16 times as bad. That's just the three degrees. Um, it would be 64 times as bad in the four degrees. Um, and so I look at that and I think that's you know, it's only a few years and things could change. But I think it's, in, in the early stage, you'd have to judge it a failure. And I wonder if some of, the, some of the forces that contributed to that failure were the impulse to manage this at a truly international, global level. And that if there were stronger leadership, say in a bipartisan way, between the United States and China, um, whether uh, some more action could be called into focus for the world. Um, there are bilateral agreements between the U.S. and China yeah. and U.S. and India on climate um, as well that we're building blocks towards the Paris. Yeah, region. but I mean like really if that was the driving force of our climate geopolitics, I think um, 
it sounds a little weird to say it as someone who really wants to believe in the UN and wants to believe in the liberal international order that we've inherited um, to be turning away from it. But it, I, I do wonder sometimes if, if, um, if there's a, a different way that might be more productive. Just to, one part of your question I just wanted to add on just to clarify, which is that that issue of the developed versus developing countries, I think was, if you want to say, I mean, maybe Dave would say the only achievement of the Paris Accords, but I think uh, overcoming what had long been an intractable divide between the two countries, you could say was the one sort of move, largest step forward of those agreements, and the way that that happened was that the developed countries, particularly the U.S., with help from the private sector, uh, made some pretty large-scale commitments to climate finance to help with uh, the vulnerabilities of climate impacts around the developing world, and of course those agreements that were made under a previous president are now very much under question. Although the similar uh, commitments made by other countries are also not being made, not being paid out. So I think um, the the moral calculus of the developing world and the de developed world is, is a really, really important one in thinking about the um, future of climate. And I don't think we're anywhere near um, coming to some kind of um, coming to some kind of resolution about it. I mean, I think um, you know India and Bangladesh are in incredibly precarious positions. They will be punished extremely hard over the next few decades by climate change, um, and there is nothing commensurate with that suffering that's being offered in the way of some kind of climate reparations or climate commitments from the from the countries of the world that benefited from the burning of fossil fuels that put those countries in that position. And I think that we will start to be talking in those terms going forward, climate reparations, et cetera, but we're so far from doing that at an adequate scale. Um, and unfortunately, those impacts are happening very, very quickly. It's likely that by mid-century, some of the biggest cities in India and the Middle East will be um, unlivably hot in the summer. So going outside during the summer in 2050 in Calcutta um, would be a lethal risk. So these, these impacts are happening very, very quickly. The, those of us in the, in the you know, wealthy parts of the developing world, uh, I think, have not yet started to reckon with the scale of that suffering and our own responsibility for it. We haven't developed this, but I'm just wondering what your opinion is. Well, what, what, am I like the, the, the president of the world? What's my yeah, role? Yeah. You know, there are studies that show the likely um, climate impacts over the, over the next century. Um, in total, in economic um, measures, um, those are a little bit misleading because they kind of undercount the suffering of the poor. So, like drowned real estate in Bangladesh counts as less than drowned real estate in Miami. That doesn't mean it's less important, but it probably is the single best measure to sort of allocate funding. And I would like to develop a system that started with those projections. That is, um, what what suffering we're likely to see and, and um, work backward from there so that if you could you know, have a projection about what Puerto Rico is gonna be dealing with over the next 30 years, we could attach a dollar figure to that and find that money somewhere. Um, now, that sounds like quite naive and I think it's unlikely to happen, but um, I also think that there's real, um, I think we need to keep in mind that this is still primarily, when you understand the scope of what's possible, it's still primarily a decarbonization challenge rather than a mitigation and adaptation challenge. I think it's important to do mitigation and adaptation, but we will be um, inflicting so much more suffering on the world for so much longer if we focus right now on dealing with the weather that we have now. Um, if that means foregoing investment in green energy and decarbonization, which is the, the thing that will solve the problem for all future generations, or can solve the problem for all future generations. As with many other things in American politics, that like the force of corporate interests is nefarious and has been problematic in our um, for our agriculture policy, and therefore for our climate policy. The problem for agriculture is bigger than that. We need to figure out what new ways of producing food that are not dependent on um, you know that don't produce such big carbon footprints and ideally ways to um, change our diets and make sure that the diets of those in the developing world don't come to mirror ours as those people get wealthier over time. Exactly how to pull that off, I think it's very complicated, but I do think it's essentially a policy question. As I mentioned earlier, you, know, you, can, you can feed cattle seaweed, you can also like, um, force farmers to work in a particular way or not 
ban them from working in a particular way. Um, we've seen a lot of development going into GMO food, but it's been almost exclusively spent on the development of pesticide resistant food. So the same companies that are producing pesticides can also sell you GMO food that grows in the, in the face of pesticides. I would like to see that investment spent more directly on heat resistant crops and, um, you know, uh, animal, you know, uh, lab grown meat and that kind of thing. Some of those solutions, I think, actually could come through big ag. I mean, I think that there is, those laboratories are powerful, and I don't think that, like, the organic farm is a solution to the global agriculture problem when it comes to climate. Ten years ago, it was really thought by every economist and every policymaker, while the humanitarian costs of climate change were likely to be significant, when you totaled up those costs in dollars and cents, the, it was quite small. And that taking action on climate change would be more expensive um, would mean foregoing economic growth, um, not just you know, not just in a very short-term way, but in a kind of sustained way. The research on that has changed dramatically just over the last few years, such that the completely conventional economic wisdom is now that very fast action on decarbonization would save the planet a lot of money very quickly. Uh, one recent study suggested it would add $26 trillion to the global economy by just 2030. Um, and you could forego all those damages that I was talking about before, those $600 trillion of damages that were on schedule to endure by the end of the century. That is, I mean, it's, in a certain way, it's gross to be counting on economic logic to change the minds of our policymakers, but I do think that over the past decade or two, um, globally, political leaders have been imprisoned by that economic thinking, that it was going to be too expensive to act on climate. And now that the conventional wisdom is that it's too expensive to not act on climate, I do think that that will make a difference. I think that um, it hasn't yet begun to sort of percolate up into the minds of those leaders, but I think that it will soon. And when it does, I actually do think that we'll see a kind of literally global sea change in the perspective of our politicians towards action. Um, now what that means in terms of who acts to what scale and at what pace, those are open questions, but I think that to the extent that we've been dealing with global political complacency on this issue, I think that that will change relatively soon, primarily because of the news from economic research. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for writing such an important book.